Okay. Um, people I'm sure will keep trickling in. So we'll just get started since we're all here. Um, so welcome everybody. Um, thanks for coming tonight. I'm excited. This is the first session of our Birds of Newfoundland uh, identification webinar series. So hopefully some of you will stick with us for the next 12 weeks. Um, and for those who are just here for tonight, welcome. We're happy to have you. Um, over the next 12 weeks, um, we will be hoping to increase your skills at identifying birds and uh, helping you to get to know them a little better and love them even more than you already hopefully do. So to start off, I'll just introduce myself. My name is Jenna McDermott. Um, I've always been involved in nature from a, when I was a small child, um, going out camping with my family. Um, but I really only got into birds after I graduated from undergrad. Um, and after that, I sort of fell into volunteering and taking short contracts and learning all about birds on my own time. And it's been a um, lots of years of learning to get where I am now. Um, and I started off knowing not much of anything uh, about birds. So hopefully we'll collect all of you into um, knowing more about birds, just like I learned about them as time went on as well. So I work for a nonprofit organization, which is called Birds Canada. We have offices and staff all across Canada. And the mission of Birds Canada is to drive action to increase the understanding, appreciation, and conservation of birds in Canada. Um, I forgot to mention also on the call here is Catherine Dale, who um, is um, also works for Birds Canada on the program that I'll tell you about in a second. And she'll be monitoring the chat a little bit um, and answering some questions, making sure everyone's getting into the webinar um, okay and everything like that. So Birds Canada across the nation has over 70,000 volunteers who um, share their energy skills and bird observations with us. And that's because we have programs all across the country um, that are really heavily volunteer on, uh, heavily involved volunteer citizen scientists. And citizen scientists basically are just regular people like you or me who contribute their data to our programs just because um, it gives them a chance to help the species that they love. So right now in Newfoundland, we um, are running two different programs. So the first one is the Newfoundland Breeding Bird Atlas, and I'm the assistant coordinator for that program. And Catherine Dale, who I mentioned earlier, she's the coordinator for um, the atlas right now. And this is a large five-year project that is used to map the distribution and abundance of the bird species that breed in Newfoundland. So information that will come out of this project will go towards conserving the birds that are found here, and it will also help to fill some gaps um, and create maps of abundance, which is pretty exciting of um, the species of birds across Canada. So for example, you could see this map of a rusty blackbird. It shows the abundance in Newfoundland um, is just sort of an empty, an empty blob there right now, but we do in fact have rusty blackbirds in Newfoundland. And so after this atlas, we'll be able to fill in information like that for all of the species that we, that we have in Newfoundland. Um, another project that we are running in Newfoundland right now is the Atlantic Nocturnal Owl Survey. And so that happens at the early spring of each year, where citizen scientists go out listening for owls across a set route in the spring, and they report back to us about what they've heard. Um, so we're really ramping up that program this year again, and anybody is welcome to join either of these programs as a participant or volunteer. Um, and you can have any skill level to join either of them. So people are welcome to get in touch with us. I'll have our information at the end um, about getting involved with these. And you'll learn more about them as, as we go through these webinars as well. Just before we get into um, today's true program, I'd just like to quickly mention um, all of our partners and funders who help support us in our project. Um, and help support us put off webinars like this. So thanks to all of these organizations. And I would also like to acknowledge that the lands that the Breeding Bird Atlas that we're running right now um, occur on are the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, whose people have been erased forever. And additionally, I'd like to acknowledge that um, Newfoundland is the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq people. These people have been protecting and stewarding the land here since time immemorial. Through the work of the Breeding Bird Atlas, 
We hope to assist this stewardship in protecting all the species that we share this island with. And Birds Canada understands that Indigenous voices, knowledge, and ongoing work on the land are critical for wild birds to thrive in sustainable ecosystems. We support the needs, aspirations, and rights of Indigenous peoples to care for the land. If you're interested in learning about what ancestral lands you're living on, if you're not from Newfoundland or if you just want to get more involved in that information, um, I'd recommend going to nativeland.ca. The link I have there um, is a really great place to start. So as we go through the rest of the evening tonight, um, essentially what we're going to be doing is giving you the tools and resources to start identifying birds. So we're not going to be getting into a ton of details on um, a lot of specific species tonight, uh, because that's going to be the rest of the weeks ahead. Um, but we will be going into some essential tools that you can use to help you identify birds, what sort of clues to look for, for bird ID basics. And we'll be going through the major bird families that are found in Newfoundland and picking out clues to help you at least put birds into families um, as a starting point. So one thing that's really uh, helpful when you're identifying birds is having a pair of binoculars. Um, of course, you can watch birds with just your eyes, but that can sometimes become frustrating. You're trying to see a bird and you're trying to identify clues on this bird, but you just can't see it as too far away. So binoculars are really important for helping just bring the features of that bird closer to you so you can um, see them more clearly. Um, when you're looking to uh, buy binoculars or borrow binoculars from somebody, you'll notice that they have two numbers, which you can see at the bottom of the screen. This one, for example, says eight by 42. The first number that you see is showing you the magnification. So this binocular is an eight times magnified uh, lens near the eye. Um, and you can get binoculars that come in different magnifications. You might think that higher is better and it will certainly make it more magnified. Um, but if you get into things that are higher than eight times, it can sometimes be difficult um, to keep the, keep the bird or whatever you're looking at in the field of view because the binoculars are usually heavier and also just the higher magnification um, makes it harder to keep steady. So eight times magnified is a pretty good number to look for. The next number that you find is going to be the aperture. Um, so if anybody is familiar with cameras, it's the same, the same concept. The aperture shows you how wide or how much um, light can come in from the bottom of the binocular. So something with a higher aperture will um, give you a bit more clarity, allow more light in, um, and you could see more colors. So a pretty good number combination that most people use for their binoculars is eight by 42. Um, so when you're potentially shopping for binoculars, you can look for that one as a good starting point. If you ever have a chance to test uh, binoculars out when you're shopping for them, I would say definitely um, ask the salespeople if you can take them out and take a look at them. Because um, for example, I have eyes that are, my eyes are quite close together, I guess. I have a small face. Um, so you can like open and close binoculars up. I guess I could use the real binoculars I have sitting beside here. You can open and close them. And sometimes if you have really small eyes, the closest together it goes, is still too wide for your eyes. So just test things out when you can before you um, purchase a pair of binoculars. When you're actually using binoculars, um, you'll notice on most, no, most pairs of binoculars that on the eye cap section, um, there'll be an option to either have them flushed down to the binocular or popped up. Um, and this is usually by twisting or folding something. And so if you wear eyeglasses or sunglasses, you're gonna wanna have those um, push down. And if you don't wear sunglasses or eyeglasses, you'll want to pop that um, eye cap up or twist that eye cap up. And that just helps get the proper distance between your eye and the lens to really help the image focus in your eye properly. So when we're using binoculars, um, this may seem like a intuitive thing to talk about, but it's actually um, quite helpful if you, rather than 
you know, having your binoculars and searching around with your binoculars already on your face, um, a very helpful thing to do is be looking at the bird or whatever option uh, object you're looking at, and then raise the binoculars to your eyes while you're still looking, rather than looking around all over the place. Because since it's already magnified, it'll be really hard to find something when you're looking through your binoculars already. Um, this is something that, like anything, practice takes perfect, or practice makes perfect. Um, so you could even practice using your binoculars inside the house, looking at something on the wall, um, just practicing getting those binoculars up to your face so you can sit, so you can consistently get the object you're looking for in the field of view. And it'll cause less frustration when you're out trying to look at that bird that's flitting around in the bushes. We'll move on and talk about field guides and reference books. And these are really good um, resources to help you study your birds at home um, or look things up after you've seen a bird outside. So um, you can get paper field guides, of course, and these come in a different, a few different uh, versions. You can get painted ones with painted pictures inside, uh, like the Sibley, National Geographic, and Peterson are pretty popular ones with painted field guides. And those basically have a um, artist's illustration of the bird, and that will show um, key features. It, it will really bring out key features that are identifying features for the bird. Um, alternatively, you can get ones that are photographic field guides, like the Crosley ID guide, um, Kaufman's field guide. And these, rather than having an illustration, have a photograph of each of the birds. And so it, it um, has them in more, I guess, lifelike postures and things like that. And sometimes a little bit harder to find the identifying features, but they usually use um, pictures that are showing those good features as well. And whether you like a painted field guide or photograph a field guide is really just a personal preference thing. Um, you can also get into, like for smaller areas, um, you can have regional field guides. So rather than having a field guide with all of the books of North America, you can get a field guide for the birds to the east. And so that just makes it easier to carry around. It's smaller, it has less options of birds in there um, because they're the only ones that are, you're likely to actually find if you're in the east, for example. Um, in Newfoundland, you can use Sibley's Birds to the East, which is a really popular one, um, or you can get even more specific and get into Birds of Newfoundland um, and Labrador. And that'll just show you the Birds of Newfoundland. Um, another version of a book you could have is a reference guide. And these are ones that you're not likely going to bring out in the field with you when you're out going birding for the day because they're usually quite a bit larger and heavier. And they're more like coffee table books that are going to have more, um, more information on a certain family of birds, for example, like the warblers or the warbler guide or the shorebird guide. Um, and those ones can be really helpful if you're interested in a certain family of birds. But again, you're probably not gonna lug that big book around with you in your backpack for the day. Um, paper field guides, I personally like a lot because it's easy to sort of flip through them take a look at things, compare species side by side. Um, and, you know, if you drop them, they're not breaking and <laughs> they don't run out of battery. <laughs> On the other hand, um, oh, sorry, I'm skipping ahead of myself here. Um, you can use the public library to help you find a paper field guide that you like, because there is a lot of different ones out there. Um, but public libraries often have a section for birds and for bird guides. You can look at them, compare, see which ones you find effective to, uh, to use as a learning tool. Um, in Newfoundland, there's a really exciting program going on um, that's a partnership between Nature NL and the public libraries, which are bird watching backpacks that you can rent from the library just as if you would take out a book. Um, and if you look into your library catalog, you'll be able to find uh, where some of these are close to you. But basically it's a backpack that has binoculars, field guides, some activities, um, and they have adult and children versions. Um, those are really cool for if you wanna just try out bird watching for a day. 
Um, so this is just an example of one of the illustrated field guides. This is Sibley's. Um, and what, no matter which field guide you decide to have, they're all going to have pretty similar things inside of them. And um, one of them is, of course, illustrations or pictures of the birds in different plumages. So the adults, adult female and adult male, if they look different, um, as well as a juvenile or different seasons, if they look different. They'll always have the size of the bird in inches or centimeters, a um, little blurb about uh, their habitat, and they'll always have a map, um, a range map. So here's another example. This is the National Geographic version. Um, it's a, a different layout, but it has all the same information um, where you have the illustration of the birds in their different plumages with um, arrows sometimes that point to key identifying features. And they have little blurb about the family, um, the range map, and then the information about the species itself. So these things are mostly points of preference. And if you compare different guides, you'll find one that you like best for yourself. Field guides are organized by families. And so basically that means um, they're organized by how genetically related they are. Um, as time goes on and people do research on different species, new information will come in about the genetics of birds. And so sometimes the ordering can get changed in, in a field guide. So depending how old a guide is or how new it is that you're looking at, um, some of the species may be in a different order. So don't be worried about uh, if you're seeing different things between field guides. Um, it's just based on, on what information went into using, uh, to showing the um, genetic relatedness there. Um, okay. So to go into range maps a little bit, range maps are a really important thing to look at. They basically show you where and when a bird is likely to be seen. So this map, for example, shows you the distribution of the white-throated sparrow. You can see it has a color for the breeding season, the migration season, non-breeding season, and a little section where they're found year round. So this is an important thing to look at. If, for example, you're looking at a bird in the world and you see two different species in your field guide that look nearly the exact same, um, take a look at the range map. Maybe only one of them actually lives where you're uh, where you are. So it's a good way of eliminating the species that are that aren't actually likely to be found where you are. Um, I'll note too that you should take range maps with a little bit of a grain of salt. They are um, the best rendition of what we know about things when they're drawn, but um, species ranges do change and also more information comes out sometimes. So maps can sometimes be um, a little behind or inaccurate. So for example, this is the range map of the Northern Solwet Owl. You'll notice that in Newfoundland over here, it is not found at all, but we know that um, Solwet Owls are found in Newfoundland now. Um, nearly across the whole island. And so if you only looked at this range map, you wouldn't expect them to be there, but they are there. So just take them with a grain of salt and um, sometimes you'll find something new. Apart from paper maps, you can also get a lot of smartphone apps that are basically field guides as well, just in a um, technological format, I guess. And um, some of the popular ones are Sibley's Birds of North America. Um, that's a paid one. So you're basically buying the books and it goes onto your phone. Um, another one's Audubon, Merlin and iBird Pro. And some of these also um, act not only as a guide but also as an identification tool. And I'll go into that a little bit later in this presentation. But I'll just show you quickly into the Merlin app. This would be the main page after uh, you download it, it's a free app from Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And so the Explore Birds section is basically um, a field guide in your phone. Um, it'll have a list of species and you could click on the species and it shows you a little blurb um, about identifying them. You can take a look at different pictures. Um, it will have a catalog of um, sounds to listen to, which is really cool thing about using um, apps for your field guides. 
because you can listen to what they sound like. Um, and then we'll also always have a, a range map as well. Okay, so let's get a little bit farther into it here. Um, some tips for when you're getting started identifying birds. One of my main tips is that um, you should be patient with yourself because identifying birds is hard and there's a lot of birds and they look different um, depending on the lighting and different times of year and how the weather looks and mistakes are gonna happen. But it's all, um, it's all just a learning experience. So just have fun with it and you'll get better with time. Um, so when you're starting, you should start with um, the common birds that you see around pretty frequently in your yard, for example, like this American robin up at the top. Um, those are pretty common birds that you'll see um, just around town. So you'll be able to look at them pretty often. Um, and when you're taking a look at a bird, and trying to identify it and maybe think of going to your field guide. Really spend some time looking at the bird before you jump straight into your field guide to look at it. Um, keep your eyes on the bird, try and get as many identification clues as you can. So take a look at the whole bird, what it looks like, what it's doing. Um, and sometimes you won't be able to necessarily identify it into a species, but you'll be able to identify it into a family or a group. And sometimes that's all you can do. You say, oh, that was a duck and that's about it. Um, and even uh, people who've been identifying birds forever can sometimes only get it to that far. Um, another tip is to just sort of spend time with your field guide if you end up buying one or borrowing from the library. Um, just sort of have it out on your coffee table or in the kitchen, take a look at it. You'll just pick things up as you glance through that um, and it'll just give you a keener eye for what to look at when you're looking at species outside. So there are four key um, ideas, I guess, that are involved with identifying really any object and that extends to birds. And these are shape, size, context, and coloration. So we use these things subconsciously all day long, every day to identify objects. Um, it's really how we navigate the world. So for example, I haven't seen every coffee mug in the world, but based on what I know about the size, shape, and context of other glassware, I can usually figure out that I'm looking at a coffee mug, for example. Um, so as you, if you see something that's new to you, you can use these steps to sort of um, narrow down what it is it uh, further and further. It, it can be used for birds as well. So we'll start with um, shape. And this is an important feature to look at for birds because sometimes you only see the silhouette of a bird uh, depending on the lighting. Um, and you can look at the shape of the bird where you're paying attention to the shape of the bill, the shape of the neck, the body and the wings. And it can tell you um, something about what species you have. So for example, we have here three different birds and they all have pretty long legs and they have kind of a different shaped body, but it's not too different. And they have a, a long bill, all of them. But if you look at their neck, for example, the one on the left has basically no neck at all. The one in the middle has like a medium sized neck and the one on the right has a really long neck. And so based on, this information, you know that these are three different species and you can look in your field guide to see like what is a really long necked species and maybe um, get that down at least to family. Some of the field guides will have, um, this is the Peterson's field guide, they'll have um, these little silhouette pages um, and it just really show like highlights um, the, the features to look at. So we're looking at sort of the shape of the bill, um, you can see number 22 there has like a really sharp kind of long bill, whereas the um, number 27 on the ground has like this really short stout bill. Take a look at the length of the tail, the one on the number 27 on the ground with the really, really long tail is very different from the short tail of the birds on the wires, for example. Um, so these are things that you should just keep your eye out for when you're looking at a bird. Um, Take, pay attention to, to the shape and size of things. This can also be helpful when you have birds in flight. 
and we're not going to get into these three here right now, but um, if you have birds flying overhead, especially hawks, falcons, um, or other raptors, the shape of the wings and the size of the wings and tail can be really helpful features to um, identifying those birds as well. When we talk about shapes of birds, we can also um, talk more specifically about the shape of the bill. Birds do manipulate their food with their bill, so it really is shaped to uh, match up with the lifestyle that they keep. Um, so for example, going from left to right here, we have um, like a shorebird bill on the top left, which is so long and pointy and straight, and they're using it to probe into the ground to pick out little mollusks and things like that from the sand as they go along the shoreline. Um, you have like this heron in the middle with this really um, sort of sharp and broad bill that's like grabbing fish and holding them to eat them, a wedge-shaped bill. And then we have the hooked bill that's used for, you know, um, ripping apart their prey that they've caught these for these raptors. You can have short and conical bills that are used for crushing seeds open. Um, or short and pointed bills that are like little tweezers for grabbing up insects that are on the warblers. Um, or for ducks, for example, you have a broad flat bill and that's used for straining insects or plant matter out of the water. So bills are really important clues to what family you're talking about. You can also take a look at the posture of a bird, how it sits um, on a tree or on a branch, if it's um, sort of bunched up or if it sits up high. Um, and you can look at the feather position as well. Um, so uh, for example, um, we have this downy woodpecker on the left there. Um, first, he, he looks really sleek. And then he looks quite fat and um, chubby, I guess, because you know the weather has gotten colder, so he's fluffed himself up. So um, do pay attention to that sort of thing. You can tell with his robin as well, like he's really puffed up, so he's a big ball. Um, but in that previous one, he's sleek, uh, sleek and upright. Um, and then for this blue jay on the right, they have this very prominent crest on the top of their head, but sometimes they'll have that crest downward um, if they're relaxed or not as alert. So sometimes um, their posture or feather positioning can um, be confusing as well. So, um, but these are just things to note. Especially if you're taking pictures, you can sometimes catch things in an odd moment like this downy woodpecker. <laughs> and then they really look super strange. Um, and so sometimes the feather and posture um, can, can be quite confusing. You can also take a look at the size of a bird. Um, size is mostly used as a rough marker because it can be really tricky to tell the size of something, uh, especially at different distances or with no context. Um, but apart from looking at the overall size of a bird, you can look at the size of pieces of the bird compared to itself. So that's relative proportions. Um, so for this, these two species, the downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker, which look incredibly similar and they're very hard to tell apart. Um, one of the key identifying features for them is the size of their bill. And that's the size of the bill in comparison to their own head. So for the downy woodpecker on the top, the bill is um, less than half of the length of its head if you turn the bill back onto itself. Whereas the hairy woodpecker, who looks basically the same, but he's quite a bit larger, um, if you compared them side by side, his bill is quite large in comparison to the size of his head. It's greater than half of the length of its head if you turn it back on itself, if you look at the picture in the bottom right. So comparing pieces of a bird to itself are sometimes quite helpful. So as I said, um, size is usually a relative marker. Um, and not very specific to the centimeter or inch that you'll find in the field guide, but if you know something is sort of a goose size, um, you can compare um, similar sized things in your field guide. You can also use the relative size of objects that you know how big they are 
um, like a bird feeder or fence post, that sort of thing, if um, you're, you're in a familiar area, um, to see how big things are in comparison to other things as well. Okay, we'll move on to context, our third clue. And context is basically what the bird is doing, where it is, the time of year, um, and how it's behaving. So when we're talking about where a bird is, we might think um, what habitat they're in, if they're on bare ground, if they're using open land or bogs, if they're sitting in a shrub hidden, um, if they're sitting on an open tree or on the water, all of these things will give you clues as to what family they are, especially. So you can um, start looking in your field guide. Um, you can also take a look, of course, at the time of year they're around to compare to your um, range map. And behavior clues will also help you identify what a bird is. When we're talking about location and habitat, this is something that um, will become more apparent to you the more you spend time with um, identifying birds and getting more familiar with different species. So for you'll eventually learn the different habitats that are preferred by each species. So for example, um, a robin, an American robin is kind of found all over the place. It's a habitat generalist. So um, it could be found in both the habitat on the top or the bottom. Uh, but some birds are more specialized. Uh, for example, a white-throated sparrow might be more likely to be found in the picture on the top, but not quite as likely to be found in a more human inhabited area like the bottom. So those are things you'll get more used to with time as well. Another thing you can look at, um, which is maybe tricky when you're first beginning, but that you, you can also pay attention to is their flight pattern. Um, some birds will fly in a straight line, some will soar, some will have an undulating flight, sort of bouncing up and down as they fly. And there might be notes about that in your field guides as well. And another thing to look at for context is their feeding behavior. Um, and a great example of this is for the ducks. Ducks are split into two different sections, the dabbling ducks and the diving ducks. Um, and there's species associated with each of those feeding behavior. So dabbling ducks are always tipping their head under the water, but they're floating on top of the water nearly the whole time, whereas diving ducks are diving underneath the water to collect um, food at the bottom of the body of water that they're living in. So even being able to see the difference in the two feeding behaviors can help you split, um, split a bird into which section of the field guide you might be looking at. And then you might even uh, still just be able to know that it was a diving duck and that's all um, and not what species it is and that's okay too. Okay, the uh, final key that we're going to mention is coloration. And I kept this for last because the other steps are so important um, before you even start looking at color. Um, if you only rely on color, these two birds here um, you would say one is a red bird or pink and one is a yellow bird um, and you might think that they're completely different species but they're actually the same species the pine grosbeak and one is just the male and one is the female and if we look at sort of the size and the shape um, that and the other clues we were looking at you'll see that um, there's there's similarities in all of those to tell you it's the same species so we are, we are going to always pay attention to the color of the bird, but um, remembering to take a look at those other keys as well. So take a look at the overall color of the bird, um, the colors and patterns that are found, especially on the face can be helpful. You can get things like um, a line straight through the eye, a different color over the eye on the eyebrow area, some very bold patterning in the face, um, like here on this common yellow throat on the top right. Um, even this yellow warbler on the uh, bottom there, it, it, for example, has no patterns on the face at all. And that in itself is a really good clue too, because um, that's a marker for them is that they don't have any patterning on the face. Um, you could also get rings around the eyes, like a lighter color ring around the eyeball. And that can be either all the way around or just partial way around um, or could be faint or quite strong. So take a look at the face. 
You'll also want to um, keep an eye on the color and pattern on the breast and belly. This is especially good for sparrows. Um, and you'll want to just pay attention to whether it's fully plain, if it has streaks on it, if it has bars across the bottom, um, if there's rings around the neck, if it has some sort of colored bib. Um, those are things to take a look at on the breast and belly. You can also pay attention to the wings. Birds will often have um, what's called a wing bar, which are these pale or white colors on the wings that are edging the feathers. Um, so some birds have very strong wing bars, some birds have none, um, some birds have different colors, especially dabbling ducks, for example, will have this, um, this really brightly colored area of the wing called the speculum. Um, and that can be an important piece to look at um, to, to identify things to species as well. Um, and then you can also have birds that have no markings on the wing. And again, like the face, that's a mark in itself. Um, be aware that for color, there are often differences between the sexes and that's called sexual dimorphism. So for example, we have a mallard on the left here. The male, this brightly colored male is on the top. Um, and the female mallard, same species is on the bottom and she's very drab sort of brown color bird. Um, males are typically brighter in birds because females are usually the ones that are sitting on the nest so they need to be um, more cryptically colored so that they can hide um, and not be noticed as much. On the right here, we have a house sparrow. So the male is on the top. He's more brightly colored and the female is quite this drab brown. So just be aware that males and females can look different. Also be aware that birds can look different between the seasons. So in the summertime is typically when they have on their fancy breeding plumage. Um, and in the winter, they'll, they'll often morph into um, a drabber plumage. Um, like this American goldfinch on the top is bright yellow and in the winter time gets a little bit more brown. And the same thing with ducks, again, they molt into um, eclipse plumages is what it's called, which is when they are, the males take on the look of the females for part of the summer um, as they molt into new feathers. So those are the four, the four um, keys that you'll use uh, to help identify birds. So when you're looking at a bird, you'll take in as much information about all of these things as you can, and then go to your field guide um, to start looking up birds. So um, I'll just pop into the Merlin app here again. You can, um, it will also sort of bring you through these clues if you're getting it to do bird identification. So if you're not sure what a bird is like this bird here, you could click on the bird ID. Um, little button and then it will ask you some context questions like where you saw it. It'll ask when you saw it. It'll ask size questions. What, how big was it? And you pick between these commonly sized birds. It'll ask the main colors, black and yellow, all things that we've talked about. It'll ask some more context. What was it doing? Where was it? And then it will create a list of possible birds. And that's the same thing that you can do when you're looking in a paper field guide. And it'll bring up this list of potential species. And then you can look and compare and see which one you think it might be like, or even see similar species and uh, compare which marks look um, different and which look the same. So you can do that with paper field guide and, um, and uh, technology field guides. <laughs> um, so, we're gonna go through the families of birds in Newfoundland now. And I have organized these by families because that's how they'll be found in your field guides. And we're gonna go through um, the similar characteristics of each of the main families. And uh, just so you can start to pick out, at least when you're looking at a bird, what family it might be in, and then you could um, start to learn from there. So we'll hop into the ducks here. Um, talked a little bit about these ducks already tonight. For all the ducks, well, for most of these um, species I'll talk about, or sh I'll show you today, they're gonna be 
um, the males because they have the more prominent plumage. Um, and especially for ducks, you'll want to focus on learning the males before the females because they do have these um, more identifiable colors, um, colors especially. And that'll help when you're when you're just learning. So ducks, we have dabbling ducks and diving ducks. The dabblers that we I've shown you here, um, they can walk on land. Um, they can take off from either land or water. And that's because their legs are sort of more centrally located on their body. But you'll see them floating in water most of the time. And most people are familiar with ducks. Um, and the dabbling ducks are going to be, you've seen them tipping down uh, with their head, with their butt up in the air, like dabbling their feet around looking for food under the surface of the water. And that's compared to the diving ducks. Um, these are often sea ducks. They're found out maybe in more uh, large expanses of open water. And they're really built for life on the water. Um, their legs are farther back on their body and they have smaller wings um, compared to the size of their body. So when they're getting into the air to start flying, they're really going to need a bit of a runway to get going. Um, you might see them sort of running along the top of the water before they take off. And they also nest quite close to the water um, because they have really a hard time walking on land. You're not really going to see these guys walking on the land much at all. And as per their name, the diving ducks, um, they are going to be submerging themselves fully underwater, diving down to the bottom to get food and popping back up. So if you see a collection of ducks off in the distance, you can tell at least um, if they're diving or if they're dabbling and be able to um, take a look at some of the species under each of those categories. Um, tips for identifying female ducks are to learn especially the shape of the duck first. Um, as you can see here, all of these options of different species, most of the female ducks are really quite brown and hard to tell apart at a first glance. Um, so definitely take a look at males first. They're, they're much easier. Um, but the shape of the males and females will be the same. So you'll look at how round the head is, the shape of the bill, um, how long the neck is, that sort of thing is all going to be helpful um, to tell the female ducks apart. But if you can't, if you can't get a female duck <laughs> down to species, like they're so difficult. So don't be too hard on yourself. Um, you can also, if they stretch their wings open, take a look at that scapular coloration, which is that patch on the wing of bright color. And that can um, help you identify female ducks as well if you get a chance to look at that. Okay, we'll move on to the grouse and allies. So these are, uh, these family names are ones that you'll be able to find in the, in the field guide family groupings. Um, so grouse and allies, we have four different species here. And these are sort of your chicken-like ground-dwelling birds. They're going to be walking on the ground. They're shaped like a chicken. Um, some of them are super dopey. You can walk right up to the grouse species here, for example, and they'll just look at you. <laughs> um, but they really are looking a lot like chicken-like birds, um, walking on the ground and pecking at things on the ground. Then we have loons in Newfoundland in the summer. We only have common loons. Um, and these are superficially duck-like, but they are, um, they are different. And they are expert divers. So they, they'll spend their whole summer on the lakes or ponds. Um, their legs are incredibly far back on their body. So you won't see them walking on land unless they're getting on or off their nest. Um, and in the summer, if you're lucky, you'll maybe see them carrying their young on their backs. And they do that to keep their young warm. They'll nestle on their back under their wings until they're able to warm themselves. In comparison to a duck, you can see the shape of the bill is really different. It's long and pointed instead of sort of broad and flat. Um, and they also have a very fluffy posterior instead of a longer, um, sharper tail um, that the ducks will have. Of course, in Newfoundland, we have a bunch of wonderful seabirds <laughs> um, that are really cool. Seabirds is in a category that you're going to find in your field guide, but the, um, all of the birds here will be found near the beginning of a field guide um, under different family names. These birds are all found 
in sort of larger colonies. They spend their entire year out at sea in the open ocean, except for a short period of time when they are back on land in their breeding colonies on the cliff sides or on um, islands. And then there's huge numbers of them together. So they fly really, really long distances to hunt for fish. They are amazing divers catching fish for their young. Um, and as many of you know, of course, they're an important part of Newfoundland culture and identity. Um, so these birds, when, when if you're wondering what a huge group of birds in birds is on a, on a island or a cliffside, it's likely a sort of seabird. We also have, of course, the diurnal raptors. These are hawks, eagles, and falcons. Um, diurnal just means active by day. Um, so um, falcons are sometimes not included in the diurnal raptors section of your field guide, but sometimes they are. Uh, these are birds of prey. They're hunting from either the air or from a perched location. And um, if you take a look at all of their faces, you can see they have this really sharp hooked bill that they're using um, to eat their prey. These can range in size quite a lot from the large, large bald eagle down to the American kestrel, um, which is really quite small, um, even smaller than a robin. We also have shorebirds here. Um, in the summer breeding season, there's really only these six species that you're likely to find um, in the fall and spring migration seasons. There's quite a few more different species that, um, that can be found in Newfoundland, but these are the summertime ones. Um, shorebirds, when you're looking at them, you can see a lot of different variation in their bill size uh, and shape, and also um, their body shape and size. So you could watch how they're feeding as sort of an identification tool um, and take a look at the bill for identification. But a lot of these birds are, of course, found near water, as their family name indicates, shorebirds. But then some of them, um, like the killdeer, for example, or the Wilson snipe, can be found more inland as well um, in like boggy areas or um, just sort of open areas too. So shorebirds can sometimes be a bit of a confusing name. But they're all going to be mostly um, hanging out on the ground um, on these long legs walking around. We of course have gulls and terns in Newfoundland. So um, these birds can be hard to identify at a distance. So often you might never be able to get that down to a species. If you're seeing a bird flying far away, you might just know that it's a gull or that it's a tern. Um, in the winter, we have more species of gulls, um, but in the summer we really have herring gull, ring-billed gull, and great black bat gull. Um, they all have this sort of long multi-purpose bill and really quite quite long wings and a heavy set body. Um, most people know what a gull is from, from looking at a distance. If you're wondering about what a tern is, it's basically like the sleeker, smaller cousin of a gull. So instead of having a um, sort of heavy wing beats, they are having narrow wings and a narrow tail, and they fly around almost like bats at times, and they have very sharp pointed bill. Um, gulls and terns also nest in colonies, um, but usually when you're seeing them around town, they're just there. Uh, trying to get some french fries <laughs> or um, you know they're using those areas as as feeding grounds rather than breeding grounds. Fan favorite always is the owls. So in Newfoundland we have several species of owls. Some are active in the day and some are active in the night um, but all of the owls have these big facial discs and that um, with their feathers around their face and that helps to funnel sound into their ears. And the ears are actually offset at different points on their head, which helps them detect exactly the location of their prey, um, which they're mostly finding by sound. So most people can identify at least the family owl um, by sight because of this very distinct looking face. 
Woodpeckers are also pretty familiar to people, usually um, because their name is quite indicative of their behavior. They are pecking on wood, usually. <laughs> um, woodpeckers uh, will often sit upright on a, on a on a branch or sorry, on a tree trunk, I guess. And they hold themselves up with these stiff tail feathers um, as they move up and down the tree trunk pecking for insects. Um, so the ones we have in Newfoundland are typically some version of black and white uh, with maybe a little extra coloration in them, but they all have this long, sturdy bill that they're using for pecking at the tree. Um, and you'll of course be able to find them by listening to where the pecking sounds coming from or the drumming's coming from um, and know that it's a woodpecker. We do also have the Northern Flicker, which can sometimes be confusing to people because um, it is a woodpecker, but um, it's often found on the ground as well. They really like finding ants. So they'll even sit on lawns and stuff like that and peck on the ground. Um, but they have the same body shape as the other woodpeckers. Um, Flycatchers is another family. Uh, we have um, three species here, typically. They, uh, as their name implies, catch flies and aerial insects. And so what you'll see them doing is sitting on a little uh, branch, flying out to catch insect, flying back to the branch and eating it. And they sit very upright. They have a quite upright posture um, as they go out and catch insects like that. Um, these are often identified sometimes by song or call because they can look quite similar at a distance. We have also the corvids, uh, which include crows and jays. And these birds are, of course, highly intelligent. They are pretty crafty. Um, they often are known a little bit of as campsite robbers. They'll, they're not very shy. They'll come up for food sometimes um, if you're out at the cabin or whatever. Um, and these birds are often quite loud and vocal. I'll just note these two species, American crow and common raven, um, because they are a, a commonly difficult to differentiate. Um, as you can see, they look quite similar, but American crow is quite a bit smaller than a raven. Um, and if you get a, a close up, a close look like this um, outside, you'll you'll see that a crow has a much smaller bill compared to the size of its head. It's around the size of its head if you flipped it backward. Whereas a raven, the bill is longer than the head, um, and it's quite heavy. And you'll also be able to see the difference in the neck on the common or even the neck feathers are really um, majestic and um, I guess shaggy, whereas an American crow has a very sleek, um, a sleek neck with not much feather differentiation showing. If you see them flying, an American crow has a rounded tail in flight and a common raven has a diamond or wedge-shaped tail. So those are things you can look at uh, if they're perched or flying. And they do also sound different, but that's talk for another day. <laughs> we also have swallows here. Um, these are aerial insectivores. They'll catch insects as they fly around on the wing. They fly almost like bats as well. Um, they're like aerial acrobats. They have long, narrow pointed wings. Um, and depending on the species, you might find them more close to human habitation, or you could even find them out on the coastline like the bank swallow um, or sort of in more remote areas. We do have a couple of kinds of chickadees. Um, these are familiar birds in um, trails around town, usually uh, in town, uh, bird feeders. And um, they're curious little birds with short, short blunt bills, sorry, short, sharp bills. And um, they will go around uh, picking under bark and stuff to, to get out insects. Um, same with the nuthatch. We have a red-breasted nuthatch and they'll be walking up and down tree trunks, um, peeking under the bark. And they'll also come to bird feeders as well. Males and females of these species look the same. We also have um, different species of thrushes. So this includes the American robin and also these other species of thrushes that I have up here. Um, thrushes have really long legs. They're often found hopping on the ground. So they're looking for insects under leaf litter and stuff like that. 
um, these long legs, a sturdy sort of body with like a quite a strong um, breast area. And um, they have this, this broad, this long sort of all purpose bill. Um, these birds are often hard to see other than the American robin because they're sneaking around in the underbrush, but they're um, quite easy to tell apart by song. We also have warblers here, quite a few different species. Um, people call these sometimes the jewels of the birding world because they're so bright and colorful and pretty. Um, and they flit around in the trees sort of nonstop because they're so full of energy. Um, and they're using these sharp bills, these short, short sharp bills that they have to pick insects off of, off of tree branches and leaves like um, while they're feeding. So the males are often these super bright colors with yellow and black. Um, and the females are usually quite a bit um, drabber or less bright um, than the males. So I'd recommend um, identifying warbler males first because it'll just be easier for you um, to not get overwhelmed by them. Um, they often will be sort of at the, some of them will be at the tippy tops of trees, so they're hard to see, so you can get what they call warbler neck looking at these, but thankfully the trees in Newfoundland aren't too tall, so <laughs> maybe it's not so much a problem. Um, there are a lot of different species of warblers in Newfoundland, so I'd recommend um, just picking a few of the most common ones like these three and really paying attention to those when you first begin um, because it'll be way less overwhelming than um, trying to pick out all of the different warbler species. So if you're trying to figure out these buddies, um, don't get overwhelmed if there's, if there's a lot of them going on in your area. We also have um, some different species of sparrows and juncos in Newfoundland. Um, these are a pretty tricky group because they're mostly brown streaky birds. Um, you can definitely take a look at the patterning on the face and the breast for these guys. When you're watching them, they'll often be on the ground or in low lying trees and shrubs. They're pecking at the ground for seeds, like small little seeds or nuts. Um, and they're using that broad bill to sort of crack open the seeds to eat what's inside. Males and females of these species look um, the same or very similar. And um, the song can also be helpful for learning these guys. But again, that's a talk for another day. <laughs> we also have blackbirds in Newfoundland. And um, there's not too many different species of them, but they're usually dark. Um, dark colored and associated near water. And they have these long, sharp bills. Um, they're around robin sized and they're also quite vocal. And um, this is the last family, the finches and grosbeaks. These birds um, are all are seen in cities and towns as well as out in more rural areas. And they're often up at the tops of trees um, if you have bird feeders out in the winter, you might have some of the finches coming to your bird feeder. Um, and males and females look different. So these are the males that I have shown here. Um, females will again be more brown or drab or colored. And these birds are going around picking the seeds um, off of coniferous trees usually, or um, small seeds out of, of some smaller plants. So they have this, uh, this bill that is, is good for eating seeds. And then finally, we just have one species here, the house sparrow, I've left him for the end because it's actually a European bird. Um, it's not actually related to our own sparrows. So it's often at the very, very end of your field guide. You won't find it with the rest of the sparrows. Um, these are really common city birds. You'll find them um, really anywhere there's human habitation. They're always finding places uh, underneath siding and stuff like that to, to nest in. So the males on the left here and the females on the right. Um, so if you have some birds that are that are always living near your house, they could be a house sparrow. I mean, you'll find them at the end of your field guide. Okay, we are, I guess I'm maybe a little slow today, but um, we just, I just have a few resources I wanted to tell you about here at the end. Um, there's a resource online called, um, uh, sorry, eBird is a, is a website 
that has a resource um, that is free. You can make quizzes on it. Um, so basically you can, you can choose to have a, a quiz and it'll pop up um, based on, you can choose based on um, a location and a date and it will pop up with a picture and you can choose um, what, it'll give you a series of uh, options. You can choose which one you think it is. Um, and so this you can use as sort of a learning tool, not necessarily like a quiz. And you could just um, compare the different species that they've given you as options to see which one, uh, what the differences are. Um, and that's a pretty uh, good way to start looking at things, especially now where there's maybe not as many birds around if you're wanting to get head start. Um, I'll also note that Nature Newfoundland and Labrador often hosts monthly or well, this is an old post, but they often have bird learning nights. So if you take a look at their social media, if you're on social media, um, you can check and see if they're having a bird learning night. So they go through these eBird quizzes together and that'll help um, give people feedback and uh, see what clues people are looking at to identify the birds there. What else have we got here? Um, this is another online resource. It's called Dendroika. The website is Dendroika. Um, you can make up little quizzes on there as well um, with photos or with songs and calls. Um, and if you make a free login, you could also make custom lists. You can study your birds um, as much as you want to. And I have the website down there. Um, I will send a follow-up email with all these resources in it. So if you've been scribbling madly, um, I should have said this at the beginning, I will send things along. <laughs> um, and last but not least, um, Birds Canada has a photo identification guide, and it's a similar thing. You can choose a location and a date, no, um, and then it will it will come up oh, with a falling down a sheet of different photos um, of bird species um, that are found in your area. So this is a cool resource if you want to print it out or have it up on your computer and see which birds you see in your neighborhood, or have it as an activity for kids um, or for yourself. Um, or to even to make a list in your yard of what birds you could expect there. Um, so that's just one other resource that is out there in the world. And that actually brings us to the end here. Sorry, we're a little bit over time, um, but thank you everybody. I hope you have a little bit of an idea of uh, what tools you can use to identify birds. Um, as you get started, definitely remember to be patient with yourself. And it's an exciting journey to go on to get into the bird, the bird world. There's so many out there to be excited about. Um, if you do want to get involved in the Atlas or have more questions about it or the Nocturnal Owl Survey, you can get in touch with us uh, with our email here um, with Catherine or I. And um, if anybody has any questions, um, I see there's a lot of things in the chat. I don't know what they are. Maybe Catherine, you can jump in here and let me know. <laughs> Sure, Jenna. Um, thank you for that. You did a great job, as always. Pretty much everything that's going through in the chat, at least that I'm seeing, is thank yous. Um, people saying that you did a great job. Um, there were a couple questions, but I think we tackled them all during your presentation. Um, so if, if I missed any, though, and somebody had a question that I didn't cover, feel free to type it into the chat again, or you can just unmute yourself and ask us. For sure, yeah. And remember everybody, if you want to come to the webinars coming up in the next weeks, make sure to register ahead so you get the Zoom link. Um, and we'll be going into different families in more specifics um, as the weeks go on. So you can see the schedule online on our website. Um, I, I will just mention somebody did ask this. So the Zoom links for each presentation are different. You can't use the same Zoom link from this week. Uh, so that's why you do need to register for um, each of the webinars separately so that you get the right Zoom link for the week. <laughs> um, I thought I saw a question. Oh, I'm going back. Uh, yes, Mark <laughs> asked what family pigeons belong to. Hmm. Um, I'm not sure exactly what the name of the family is, I guess, but I guess it's probably in the dove. Columbidae? Is that, am I making that up? It's, it's doves and... Uh, Pigeons and doves, that's what my my book says. The family is Columbidae, pigeons and doves. Yeah, so that's the pigeons you see around town and then um, sometimes on the West Coast we'll get mourning doves as well. 
which would be in that family. Um, and uh, actually, occasionally we get um, morning doves in St. John's too, Jenna. So oh, it's not well, just a go. West Coast thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, and a couple people have asked about uh, a couple people have asked about recordings. Um, so we do record these sessions. We will be uploading them to our website as we go. Um, last year's version of this course is currently available on our website under the tutorials and um, bird ID sessions. Um, so you should be able to find them there if you want to look ahead. Um, it's kind of fun to come to the live ones because for every other session except this one, we will be doing some quizzes, which is kind of a fun way to test your knowledge. Um, Okay, sorry, the chat's going awfully fast here, so I'm trying to <laughs> read. Uh, do we send reminder emails each week with the link? Yes, when you register, you will automatically get a link right as you register, and then it will send you an automatic reminder two hours before the webinar. Um, common notable backyard birds and city birds in Newfoundland. Uh, well, the ones that I see all the time are dark-eyed juncos. That's my most common bird. They love my feeder. Um, That's true. In cities, you also see chickadees, lots and lots of European starlings. We we did have some questions about why we didn't shout out the starlings today, but I said that we will uh, cover them later. Yep, good note. Yep, the um, crows and ravens are also pretty common in town. Um, and the blue jays, depending uh, on where you are, maybe in the time of year. Um, now I'm thinking of things in the winter, but... <laughs> yeah, we need things in the winter too because it's cold. Um, it's in St. John's during the summer, we get a lot of yellow warblers. Yellow warblers yeah. everywhere in St. John's in the summer. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, one of the cool things about uh, Newfoundland is you can often see seabird colonies pretty uh, easily. Yes. Okay. I don't think I missed any. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I don't think we missed any questions there. Um, so I think we are we're finished for this week, but thank you all again for coming out. It was really great to see so many people. Um, yes. A pop-up bird watching event at Kitty Vitty would be great. <laughs> I always find bird watching is even better if you've got a pint of beer to go with it. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that would be great. I know that in some years, Nature NL has done a winter gull ID session, um, and they do have uh, they do actually have a have people go out to Kitty Vitty Lake and have a look at the gulls there. I'm not sure if they're doing that this year or not, um, but certainly, if uh, we hear anything about it, we'll pass that along to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks everybody again for coming out tonight, and we hope to see you in the weeks to come. Okay, yeah, well.